Thank you very much indeed, Mr. <laughs> John Mills, British Future, for bringing the platform together, and it's great to be here uh, with Claire, who's done, whose work on the book is fantastic, uh, and Lisa in particular, because the Centre for Towns, I've never known a single organisation change public debate to the extent that the evidence they've produced has got to. I want to be deliberately provocative uh, this evening and ask actually whether Labour as it now stands, accepting Visa and many others of course, actually wants to win the working class that we're talking about. Uh, I spoke at the World Transformed event on Saturday um, and I'm not knocking, it was a very good and engaged discussion. I went there to argue, as my organisation, the English Labour Network does, that people's identity is a crucial part of the relationship with the political party. Before people engage with policy, engage with programme, they say, will these buggers stand up for people like me? So I was talking about some of the same people that Lisa's been talking about, people who tend to live in areas which are predominantly but not exclusively white, who tend to be working class, but much more likely to say I'm English rather than I'm British. And the debate actually centred around this sort of visceral fear that people had that in order to engage those voters, they had to abandon all their principles, which they actually recognised as sort of liberal, cosmopolitan, middle class uh, values. But the final question that came from the floor <coughs> really struck me. Somebody asked the question, can't we talk about the people we're talking about tonight, can't we just do without that demographic? Can't we win without them? And that really hit me for two reasons. One is actually the answer is no. Uh, and all the electoral <laughs> analysis says, we are so equally divided as a country, nobody can win without both groups of voters, and Lisa's just been talking about that. But secondly, as a councillor as an MP, I spent 34 years representing that demographic, as he called it. And although I come from rural East Devon and not from working class Southampton, these were people who I was proud to represent, with whom I formed friendships, we had many campaigns, we had many ups and downs, and it's quite impossible for me as a Labour person to imagine a Labour Party that doesn't at its heart want to represent the people I represented for 34 years. But there have been many changes in those 34 years, well it's for 38 now, I think that stood down some time ago. Um, huge social changes, at which point you probably think, oh, he's going to talk about immigration now, but I'm not going to talk about cricket. Just to illustrate something, when I started playing cricket in Southampton in the 1970s, I reckon that 50% of the teams I played against were works teams. From the shipyard, the rail works, the cable company, the tobacco factory, and they played on grounds that were, cut, were funded by the company, uh, with good sports and social centres. They were part of a network of social institutions, of friendships, of communities that went well beyond politics and trade unions, but based around a working city. All of that has now gone. So when things like immigration did come along, they came on top of something in communities that were falling apart compared with what people could remember from just a few years before. Now, I'm going to go into the immigration debate, because we've had that one before, but we know that the views of people in these communities were sidelined and marginalised, and Lisa sort of made that point. Instead of saying, let's talk about what it is you're concerned about, so people got labelled as racists rather than have an engagement in what they were actually saying. But I don't think that's an accident, and I don't think it's just because that issue was about immigration. I think it's about the way that part of today's left, but a very influential part of it, it actually has a strategy of politically marginalising this part of the working class. And I'm going to talk here about Paul Mason, who's an example of one of those figures in our movement. Paul's a capricious character. His columns don't necessarily logically follow each other from one month to the next. And when, on, when during the World Cup, he posted an inebriated photograph of himself with the St George Cross on his... Um, on his cheek, I did have to point out that two years before he'd written an article in The Guardian saying, I don't want to have an English identity, and I thought, you know, you can, it does change. But he wrote something very important a couple of years ago. He said, Labour's strategy must be based on the realisation that Labour's heartland is now in the big cities, among the salariat and among the globally orientated, educated part of the workforce. Well, clearly those voters are and should be part of our base. But that's actually an extraordinary writing off of the power and the potential and the rights of millions of working class voters. But in his view, again, he said, it is no disaster for Labour to find its core support among this demographic. 
because it is the future of the workforce in any successful 21st century capitalism. Now, John Crudus has done much more than me to trace the intellectual origins of these ideas. But underlying this is a sort of new Marxist idea or a refashioned Marxist idea that the only people who really matter are the people who are at the cutting edge of building the new economy. Those who Mason calls the educated, salaried, cosmopolitan and pro-global modern workforce of the big conurbations. It's like a rerun of a debate of 60 years ago where it would have been the proletariat or maybe the proletariat and the peasants if you were in the right country. But it's not the proletariat anymore, it's certainly not the peasants, it's the graduariat. They are the people who matter because they're at the centre of the new economy. They're the historically significant part of the labour market. All that's left for those outside the cities in the constituencies that will actually decide the next election is the promise to borrow billions of pounds of money to plough into those places. Well, that's good. But the, that politics takes all agency away from the people that we're talking about. All sense that they are equal partners in building a new society. It reduces them effectively to passive recipients of borrowed money, of measures decided for them by their more progressive and more future-friendly betters. But we won't win if we just promise to do better for people who've half stopped listening for us, to us already. It's only if they're actually the centre of our politics, if what we want to do in their communities is actually built on what they want for their future, their aspirations, not somebody else's for them, that we've got a chance of winning. So unless we put those who've suffered most from globalisation at the heart of building a better world, we'll still be met with scepticism. Uh, wherever you were on Brexit, Brexit showed that they will insist on their right to shape the future if they get the chance, and the left should be responding. And they do include a disproportionate number of those who feel most English and who are not looking for somebody to create another identity for them. And the honest, funny thing is that while the left sneers at Englishness, these were the people out there cheering England's multiracial and diverse football team this summer. So this view about who really matters it's not just politically wrong, because I don't think the relationship between the young professionals and the modern economy is anything like the old industrial working class and the factories. Uh, we will lose our elections if we carry on doing it. Um, we can't win if large parts of the working class are given secondary status in working out what Labour should be for. And it leads to dead-end policies like universal basic income. Um, I don't know about other people, I've never met any advocate of universal basic income who ever thought that they personally would have to survive on it. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, if that's our policy, the communities we're talking about would be full of people on this new modern poverty line because we wouldn't be doing the business of doing what people actually want, is trying to find fulfilling jobs that people want, not necessarily 48 hours a week, sure, and take advantage of new technology. So. The question I raise, and I think it's a serious one, is we need to understand the thinking that lies behind some of the attitudes that we find in the Labour Party today. Because unless, as I say, we are a party that wants to represent, if you like, the people I represented for 34 years, we will fail as a party. <coughs> and we will deserve to fail as a party. And unless we're prepared to ask them to join with us in building a new society that means something to them, I think we'll deserve to fail.